Minda Wilson with Urgent Care. Uh, today I'm here to talk with Janae Palais, author of the new book, Living in Orgasmic Life, a former lawyer, and here to talk about her transition from healthcare lawyer to advisor to women and couples on uh, changing their sexuality. Uh, welcome to the show, Janae. Thank you, Minda. I'm super happy to uh, be here. So you started out as a lawyer, a healthcare lawyer. What type of healthcare law did you practice? I was practicing healthcare antitrust litigation, which basically oh my meant goodness. that, yeah, I know. I, we were representing, at the time, nurse anesthetists um, who were suing anesthesiologists for basically not allowing them to practice freely in the state of, I think it was Montana and West Virginia. I can't even remember. It was a long time ago. <laughs> wow. And then I, I can see why that might not have been your cup of tea. So then you, you move more into working in nonprofit areas. Yeah, I, I, I um, you know, I really loved health. I've always loved health care. I probably should have gone into medicine, except I didn't like the side of blood. I still don't. So I guess that would have been a problem. <laughs> but, um, so I ended up just, um, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., which is where I went to law school. <clears throat> and I started working for not-for-profit health care organizations that were membership organizations representing, um, at the time, we called them allied healthcare professionals. I think they call them something else at this point. And I love that. I did a lot of um, government work. I um, ran their Washington, D.C. office, so we did a lot of lobbying. And eventually, I just ended up running a bunch of different organizations as their executive directors, um, which was really fascinating for me because, you know, I sort of had my hand in a lot of different areas, including business development and creating new programs. Um, so yeah, that was actually pretty, pretty fun and pretty juicy and was very, yeah, it was alive. I did that for about 15 years and then I started my own consulting firm. So, you know, I, I've, I've been enmeshed in healthcare for a long time. And all this time you were married <laughs> and you, and, and you, you said it wasn't really, it wasn't really a great, marriage you were you were friends but you weren't really sexual partners that yes for with the exception that we do have two children so mm -hmm. we, we had we obviously had some sex in our marriage but not a whole lot um yeah i mean we fairly quickly became uh roommates rather than really lovers or sexual partners and, um, and it happened, as it often happens, kind of gradually. And I say fairly quickly because it was probably five or seven years after, into the marriage where things started actually really shifting. And, um, but it also kind of happened gradually. You know, it, it was always sex for me. And this was really my issue was always a problem. It was, I had, um, it, it was just always uncomfortable and painful for me. So there was never any pleasure or joy in it, certainly no orgasms in it. And it was just something like I tolerated because I knew I was supposed to do it, but it often caused a lot of pain. And then that caused a lot of tears and that caused a lot of drama. And then my ex-husband was like, who wants to do this? Right. So, so it was, it, it's a, it was a downward spiral, unfortunately. What made you say, okay, or what made you finally in your mind say, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm going to address this? Because it sounds like it's something, you know, that you had a, a busy career, you had two children, you were a single person, and, and you just, something flicked the switch in you and said, okay, I'm going to look at what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think when I finally decided that I wanted to leave the marriage, which was, you know, I was, I was like in my late 40s at that point when I decided to leave the marriage. We'd been married for over 25 years. Um, I just, you know, I guess I looked at my life and I said, like, this can't be all there is to life. There has to be more here. You know, yes, I have all this success externally, but inside I'm really not that happy. And, you know, there wasn't a, a ton of 
love or connection or intimacy, let alone the sex in the relationship. So I was very, very starved for touch and starved for connection. Um, and I also, and I knew I was going to leave, but uh, I also knew that I had to look at this because if I wanted to have a relationship, you know, if I wanted to have uh, a connection with another man, other people, like I had to deal with my sex, my problem. Um, and it, it just forced me to like, you know, really take a deep dive and say like, what is going on here and what are we going to do about it? Um, I think it was just a matter, it was almost like a matter of survival, right? Like I, it, it came to that point, like it was so intense for me. It's like, I've got to look at this. I can't keep on keeping my head in the sand. You know, I have a lot more, hopefully years of my life to live and I don't want to live it this way. So I, I think like with most people, the pain of the pain became so intense and the fear that, you know, I had to, from, at least for me, I had to address it. I had to take a hard look at it. So what was the road you took? Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, it was a very happenstance kind of thing, which is that I, um, I did some personal work. I started, I started getting involved in some spiritual work, which I'd never done before. And so that started to open up for me some memories that I really didn't have in my childhood and some awarenesses of things that start that had happened to me um, that were not at all sexual abuse, but there were a lot of shaming incidences that I had as a child. And so that was the beginning of the road. And then um, I started doing some dating before I really solved the problem, but I started doing some dating and I happened to meet a man in New York, which was where I was living at the time, who had done some Tantra, uh, not a lot, but a little bit, but he was really all excited about it. And he wanted to introduce me to what it was like. Um, and so we had some experiences that were just really mind blowing for me because it was a very, very different approach to sex than anything I had ever experienced mm-hmm. before. It was very mindful. It was very slow. It was very honoring. Um, and it just felt completely different than my, all, any of the experiences I'd ever had about, around sex. Um, and it was very powerful. And I realized like, oh, there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here for movement, for growth. Um, my body is starting to respond in a way I've never seen it respond before. And I need to know more about this. Like this is, is obviously going to be my doorway. And it did become well, my doorway. Was it something you were afraid of? Or was it something that you just wanted so badly that you just sort of you know, were you afraid to change your life? Was it something you just wanted so badly? You put the fear aside. I mean, what, what sort of made you move in the direction and willing to do these things? I I think what made me move in the direction and willing to do these things was my desire to get unstuck And also, I really was starved for connection and intimacy, and I really wanted another partner, another relationship, and I knew that I couldn't have it unless I handled this issue, because I couldn't just say, hey, I'm this awesome woman, I'm smart, I'm successful, I'm fun, yada, yada, but we can't have sex, you know, (laughs) like that just wasn't going to fly. And so I knew that you know, that was part of it. It was like survival at the, at the time. That was, I think what I was thinking. It was Mm -hmm. like, I, what I want, I can't have unless I actually deal with this. And also like, I just felt so broken and I just wanted to know, can I be unbroken? Can I be fixed? You know, um, there was a huge desire, a longing for me to, to feel whole again, because I didn't feel whole. I felt so broken from that, from that marriage. And and for people that maybe maybe don't have a, a partner, is that process? It, can they go through the same process even if they're not with someone? Absolutely. 
I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the way in which, the way in which I now work with, uh, with, let's say for, with women primarily, um, who feel like they're, they've been broken and they're totally sexually shut down is to work with them individually. Because really at the end of the day, I, my, I was kind of in a lucky situation. I had a man that was, you know, and actually he wasn't my partner. We really, he really just became like a healer for me. Um, but he was very, very safe. Uh, but that's not easy to find. And um, I think the, the most powerful way to start working when you're feeling that you've had all this sexual shame and feel really broken is to work um, with a woman, actually, for most women, unless you have been abused by a woman, which creates a whole other set of safety issues. Um, and also, in, it's really about exploring your own sexuality. And that's really what my, even though, you know, he was sort of, if you will, a facilitator or a guide in some ways, that was just like the very taste of the journey. When I really took a deep dive and started doing all of the work and training that I did, it was all about me exploring my own body, exploring my own sexuality, learning how to love my body, um, both emotionally how to love myself as well as physically how to love myself, which is something I never had had access to. And so I think that the, I know that the doorway to opening up our sexuality is through ourselves. Um, that's where it actually needs to start. I think my journey was maybe a little bit unusual, but Tantra, I think also provides a setting where you can create a sense of safety that you can't create in other types of sexual um, relations, relations given just the spiritual, spiritual element of it, which most people don't have access to, you know, uh, with a, with a partner. Um, but I think that's the, that's always for me, the place that I start with, uh, with people. So you talk about the sexual blueprint. What is that? And how does it affect your life? Yeah. So our sexual blueprint is, you know, it, 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 it really is all of the messages and social conditioning that we have received around sex from an intimacy, right? So there's both the sexual blueprint. There's also an intimacy blueprint um, from very, very early on, like very early on in our life. The message, you know, how, for example, our parents modeled touch. So for example, if you grow up in a household where people really weren't touched, there wasn't a lot of nurturing, I see this a lot, it's often very hard for you to receive touch or to feel comfortable being touched, right? It, it, it actually may feel um, very uncomfortable for you and even threatening in some ways. Uh, if you grew up in um, a household where, you know, you were conditioned and told, particularly if you grew up in a very religious household where sex mm -hmm. is bad and sex is shameful and, you know, and sex is only for, you know, the man's pleasure, right? There's no conversation mm -hmm. around that. Then you take, we take all of those messages and experiences that we have early childhood sexual experiences, you know, with like maybe being caught playing doctor and being shamed around that. It's one of the things that happened to me. Um, negative sexual experiences. The first time we had sex, uh, a way in which maybe we were touched without consent, all that. We take all of that into our adulthood. And it mm -hmm. basically forms, you know, the blueprint for what our relationship is going to be with sexuality as an adult. That's what a sexual blueprint is. And it's very, very powerful. Um, and it can be certainly can be changed, but we have to have an awareness of like where all this is coming from first in order to change. You know, it's, it's often a core set of beliefs that we have that actually, you know, we need to realize some of them are false and they're not our beliefs. They're somebody else's set of beliefs. So what's the difference between the unwillingness to receive touching and those people who don't want to really feel out of control? Like there's differences in, in those mindsets, right? In terms of sex. Yes, for sure. Um, 
there it depends right like if you if you don't want to receive touch if 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 receiving touch feels uncomfortable for you then you know i'm curious about like well what are the conditions under which you've received touch in the past right is it that you've had you know touch that has been unpleasant or touch that has been unwanted in which case there's some trauma that you want to work through um uh, is it that you like you don't like receiving touch because it actually makes you um, dissociate, leave your body uh, again as kind of a defense mechanism, which is really different? Or is it that you don't like receiving touch because you don't like the way your partner is touching you, which is a huge issue, right? That, you know, a lot of I hear from a lot, a lot of women, they do not like the way their partner is touching them. And yet they're afraid to say something, right? So that's one reason, like, we don't want to receive touch. The being able to surrender peace is different. Um, and the being able to surrender peace really is more dependent on, um, I think it's a lot of it is around emotional safety. If I feel really safe with somebody, I'm more likely to allow myself to really surrender, right? And we need to surrender in order to feel, have a, have a great orgasm because orgasm is about a level of surrender, of giving up control. And, you know, a lot of, I don't know, I, I don't know about you, but I know I see this a lot of, um, you know, a lot of my female clients are control freaks. And it's really hard for us to surrender and give up control uh, because we feel like when we control things, we can keep ourselves safe. Safety is a really huge issue when it comes to sexuality, especially for women. Women really need to feel safe in order to be able to enjoy touch and in order to be able to surrender. And many of us have not felt safe. And I'm not even talking about like not safe trauma, but, you know, not safe emotionally. Like, I don't know if I can, you know, if I really open up to this person and I'm super vulnerable with them, how do I know it's not going to come back and bite me? Yeah. And, you know, when I can't access that part from, of me, it's a lot harder to surrender and let go. So when people work with you, do you teach them, you know, on the, on the touching side, people, do you teach them how to, in, if they, you know, what makes them to work with themselves so that they feel comfortable? If they're unable to feel safe, do you, do you teach them? I'm 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 not quite sure. I understand the process. Like what happens from somebody yeah, who yeah, doesn't yeah. feel to feeling say creating a safe environment. I'm not quite sure what the process yeah. is. Yeah. Well, I mean, creating a safe environment is a is is a lot around trust. So you know, if I'm if, if you know, it it can even come back down to making sure they feel safe in their body, right? So sometimes we don't even feel safe in our body. And, it, and then we're looking at sort of how your nervous system is responding to all of these different external influences. And so it's like, how do you calm your body down? How do you feel like, oh, th this body is a safe place to be? So that's one way in which I, I work. And I use a variety of different techniques to help people learn how to, if you will, navigate and manage their nervous system so they can bring their level of anxiety down because a lot of times when you don't feel safe there's a lot of anxiety around um, safety but if you're for example if you're if I'm working with um, a couple which is what I do a lot of work with couples who are in sexless marriages then you know creating safety often is about first creating the strengthening the emotional connection between the two of them because when a couple stops having sex 90% of the time they stop having sex, not because of something mechanical, but because of something that's not going right in the relationship and not having sex is just a symptom of other issues that are not going on correctly in the relationship of not good communication of not feeling, you know, emotionally connected with each other of there being anger and resentment. So the first thing is to, you know, really create the emotional safety in within the couple and if i'm working with an individual i'm creating the emotional safety within themselves that they actually feel safe inside of their body uh and um 
and then you know you know the work that i do is very um it's actually very experientially oriented so there's a lot of touch involved if i'm working with a couple i'm actually having them work on doing various different practices for them to like re- relearn how to be intimate with each other how to be in connection with each other and i go really slow because there's a lot of um when we slow down, we can, first of all, we slow down, we can start to connect with each other. Like even our nervous systems start to begin to resonate with each other. We start to just naturally breathe together. And that creates a level of calm and a level of safety between couples, right? So it's interesting. There's, it's actually some of the um, more subtle, if you will, aspects of connection that create the, the framework for couples to be able to really start having sex again. But it really starts with, you know, smaller things like, can I look at you? Can we start to breathe together? Can I look at you and feel like, you know, you're, you're there for me, that you see me? I mean, you know, there's a lot of emotional pieces before we get to the actual, okay, so this is how I want to be touched. And, you know, how do I communicate that? Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different layers of the work that uh, I work with couples on. There's the emotional pieces, and then eventually <laughs> we get to the more, like, physical pieces of arousal and um, teaching people how to touch for their own pleasure, which is, like, a very, very different experience than most people have. So for people who aren't... Um, I assume this is like a face-to-face kind of therapy that you conduct, but many people aren't aren't near where you are. So is there a process that they can go through uh, that you would recommend? Yeah. So I actually, um, most of my work is actually, interestingly enough, is virtual because I, I, well, I'm in the San Francisco area. I have clients all over the country, all over the world, actually. Um, so, uh, if people are in San Francisco, I see them, but, um, primarily I'm, I'm working through like zoom or Skype, you know, like a, a web, uh, a web virtual video program. Um, because especially when I'm working with couples, uh, the connection is between the two of them and I'm, I'm just able to direct what's happening. And then I'm, when I'm working with individuals, I still do a lot of like experiential exercises, having them touch themselves, doing visualizations, teaching breathing techniques and different aspects. Um, so, so, so not being in San Francisco is not a barrier. There's not a ton of people that are doing the type of work that, um, that a number of us have been trained on. And most of us are on the West coast because <laughs> that's where all the trainings are. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one piece of it. And, um, you know, I personally offer like for women, I offer an online program, which is a weekly, we do it, I do it twice a year. And it's a weekly program where we get together and there's some videos and educational videos, but there's a lot of conversation about our sex lives and what's working for us and that's wor- not what's not working for us and understanding some of the things we just talked about, our sexual blueprint and what gets us and what keeps us from, you know, being intimate and learning about different types of orgasms and understanding what our body wants and how to ask for it more. So there are different, you know, ways that you can um, access um, information. So what type of training do you have to go through to do what you do? Yeah, so I, I, I have done a lot of different trainings. Um, I, I'm a, I went through a, a Tantra teacher training program, so I'm a certified Tantra teacher, and I actually do teach um, Tantra workshops in the Bay Area. Um, I'm a certified somatica sex and intimacy coach. That's a very specific training program that was created by um, two wonderful sex educators here, Celeste Harrell and Danielle Hirschman. And um, it's a very much, it's very much like a um, experiential way in which we talk about sex and intimacy. Most sex therapists just have 
talking sessions with their clients and some educational sessions. And our sessions are actually quite interactive, which is very, very different because you really need interaction in sex and intimacy because it doesn't happen in the head, right? It happens in the body. Um, I'm also a certified sexological body worker, which is a, a specific body work training program where we work with the body to be able to help clients experience arousal and pleasure. And it's a hands-on program because there's a lot of wounding and it's all held in the body. So it's a way to be able to release a lot of um, wounding and, and trauma, both emotional and physical. And then what else am I? Oh, um, I'm a trauma practitioner as well. I've done, uh, I'm in the somatic experiencing trauma practitioner program. And that also is a body-based approach to be able to release um, bound energies that are in our body as a result of traumas that um, we've all, you know, experienced at some point in our life. Mm-hmm. So I have a lot of different, I think that's it. I have a, a lot, oh, I'm a holistic pelvic care practitioner for women. So that's a, a very specific program for women to help work through some of the, uh, again, the wounds that we hold in our pelvic bowl. So if somebody's been wounded, you know, an abused child or, or someone like that, um, there's a there's a way of uh, of sort of letting go of these abuses. Is that what I'm understanding? So, well, I mean, you're never yeah, you're never going to actually let go of the abuse happened, right? But what happens in an abusive situation is the body has a response to that, right? It's often a fight response or a flee response or a freeze response because of the fear that happens in the brain, we kind of go into our animal, you know, our animal brain, our reptile brain. And um, in some of the trauma work that I do, what we work on is helping to release what, what happens in a trauma often is that the body freezes, somebody's coming at you, you don't know what to do. A protective mechanism is just to freeze. And then you kind of often dissociate, which means you leave your body and it's a protective mechanism. And it's very helpful when you're in a a threatening situation, right? But what happens is the body gets stuck in that memory. And so it's something as you, as you become an adult and a partner comes to touch you, the body remembers, Oh, touch bad, you know, fear, you know, abuse, and you go right back into that place of dissociating. It's a trigger and it triggers that body response. And so what I do when I work with um, uh, people who have had sexual abuse as a child or as an adult is we start to unwind some of the experiences that the body actually had. So maybe you wanted to be able to push away, but you couldn't, right? And giving people an opportunity super, super slowly and very gently to be able to have an experience of letting the body release the energy or the movement that it wanted to do helps to reduce the impact that that trigger has. And eventually over time, that trigger just appears. The abuse never goes away. The trauma never goes away. But the way in which your body reacts to a similar type of like, oh, somebody's coming to touch me will start to um, really reduce, which will then allow the body to settle. And then you can, you know, start enjoying sex again. And that's kind of the concept of it. And are there people that have never enjoyed sex? Like you were saying, you were that way. Are there, Mm -hmm. are there people who have never enjoyed sex and can those people sort of turn their life around without having to go through this similar with the help of someone like you? Yes, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that have never enjoyed sex a lot. Um, And, uh, and there's no question that, you know, when we start to really address it and we start to understand it. And then we start to have different experiences. A lot of it is like, oh, you know, even if I'm touching myself, I'm like, oh, actually, this, this, this feels okay. 
this feels safe. I'm actually feeling pleasure. This is a different experience that starts getting anchored in the brain and the nervous system. Then you're, you're basically rewiring the brain and it's saying, oh, okay, what I used to think was scary or painful. Now I'm actually able to feel something different. I'm feeling enjoyment. I'm feeling pleasure because yes, there's a lot, you know, our brains are super, super intelligent, right? And there's a lot of neuroplasticity, meaning we can rewire the neurons, the the pathways. Um, Mm -hmm. And and when we do that, we start to have different experiences. So the answer is absolutely yes. I always say like, if I could have gone from like a woman who was pretty like shut down and never had an orgasm to somebody who's living the type of life that I'm living right now at the, at starting at the age of 50, right. Uh, than anybody, than anybody and everybody can do it. And I have clients from, you know, in their twenties to in their seventies who really have, are able to have completely different experiences and start to open up to their sexuality in way, way different ways. And so, um, so it sounds like, uh, it sounds like, are there things that people can do to improve their sex life, even if they're having, you know, maybe orgasms? Can they, can they, are there things that can make it more intimate for them? Oh, for sure. There's so many different things that you can do to improve your sex life. I mean, for, for one thing, I, you know, I feel like the, and the word I want to say is curious, be curious, right? Like, you know, one of the reasons that just people who don't have trauma, but they're just like been in a long-term relationship for 25 years and we just really not having sex anymore because it's boring, which is, you know, something I hear a lot, um, is because we get in this like awful routine of like, we just do the same thing every Sunday morning. And, you know, just like anything else, it starts to lose its sparkle. So, you know, being curious and being willing to explore and, you know, that there's a lot of research that shows that the most successful long-term relationships are couples that are curious about um, not only sex, but other things that their life, like they're constantly doing new things or going on different trips, they're visiting different restaurants they're, you know, maybe taking, you know, a workshop or they're reading erotica or they're watching porn together or maybe they're even exploring role playing, right? Like having a sensual feast, being curious is one of the things and, and exploring and doing different things. There's a gazillion different books that you can read, you know, that give you a lot of different ideas and films that you can watch. Um, that will really keep your sex life alive. And, you know, it, and it, it sounds like, you know, like even just not having sex in the same place that you have it every time, you know, <laughs> like instead of having sex in the bedroom, why don't you have sex in the living room? It's, it's amazing. Right. But just little things like that actually make it different because I think particularly for women, we're always looking for, we want something different, you know, um, so keeping your sex life interesting, isn't that challenging? You just have to be a little bit creative and, um, you'll start to see that that will make a big difference. So that I think is one thing that everybody can do. That's really pretty easily. And the, and the second thing I would say is like, just slow everything down. You know, I, I think we rush into very often we rush into sex. And if we could just like slow everything down and spend some time really like touching each other in a meaning um, and, you know, really having connection with each other and maybe spend a lot of time kissing because a lot of couples stop kissing as well. That's usually a sign that things aren't great, that the kissing goes away, right? Like what does it feel like to just to slow things down and maybe just have a high school makeout one night, you know, <laughs> without having sex? Just like what would it be like to have a high school makeout, keep our clothes on, get kind of turned on to each other, um, and then not do anything about it. Holding the desire, teasing, those are all things that really create juicy sex. And so so people that have been in, in marriages over the long term can sort of refocus their sex. And, and, and young, what about younger people who are just exploring sex for the first time? What are some of the things you recommend to them to sort of make it so that they they, uh, the process for them is healthy and enjoyable. So they don't end up in the place where the women are feeling shut down and the men are sort of 
not enjoying it to the fullest extent that they could be with their partner. I'm a huge advocate and, and believer in, um, in doing something like if you're comfortable with this, like going to some sort of like central massage workshop or some sort of workshop with your, your partner, right? Like at very, very early on really learning about sex, read my book, you know, take a workshop, learn about all of these different aspects about sexuality and ways in which you can connect with your partner, really understand for men, really understand a woman's body, learn what a woman's body looks like, the anatomy of a woman's body, understand how women get aroused. Women understand how men get aroused. So that's usually pretty, you know, easy, but, you know, being really open and communicating, communication is huge, right? So many couples, like when they come to see me, they will say to me, this is the first time we've really ever had a conversation around sex. And this may be being after married for 30 years, right? This is not an uncommon experience. So from the get go, start communicating about sex. You know, it's an important topic. What I like, what I don't like, what do you like? What don't you like? What can we Mm -hmm. try together? Right. You know, communication is so, so key. And especially when you're starting out as a young person in a new relationship and just making it a priority, like, you know, that's part of what happens is like, it just doesn't become a priority. It's, it's no longer a priority after you've got kids and everybody's busy. Even the, you know, even the millennials I work with, they are so, these folks in Silicon Valley, they are so busy, right? And they, and they don't even have kids. So they barely have time for each other. So, you know, make it a priority, put it on the calendar, you know, know that it's really important in your relationship. That's what I told my kids when they got married. Like the, one of the most important things that you need to know is that you've got to keep your sex life alive and you've got to be communicating with each other, even after you have kids. <laughs> so um, if you had one, um, so people want to reach out to you and uh, learn more about what you do and, uh, and improve their sex lives, uh, what's the best way for them to do it? Um, well, they can uh, reach me on my website, which is powerofpleasure.com, powerofpleasure.com. Um, and then they can also find my book uh, on Amazon um, and on my website, but it's called Living an Orgasmic Life, Heal Yourself and Awaken Your Pleasure. Uh, and the whole book has exercises and uh, practices Um, and case studies about different clients I've worked with, as well as very vulnerable information about my own journey um, towards sexual healing as well. So it's it's kind of juicy. Uh, So they can look at that um, as well. Those are the best ways to reach out to me to connect. This was really fascinating, and I'm sure everyone can benefit from reading your book, This is Minda Wilson with Urgent Care.